So all these things are, are secondary responses, changes in CO2 levels, but they're all to try to like preserve and compensate energy. So we're trying to pull blood into the middle and then be able to pump as much energy as we can to be able to deal with this problem we're having. A lot of people that ADHD will find, do we see problems ever with treating AD, using ADHD medications when you have POTS? Well, some people will be prescribed ADHD medications as a way to combat the low energy. So it kind of will be like, in the sequela or in like in the progression of things that happen eventually they're just like well we've given you the beta blocker you've had the midodrine the volume expander of fludro you we've given you everything but you're still tired maybe we give you a stimulant as well um and then if you get real good you get the stimulant and then also a, a sleeping aid as well because the stimulant makes it hard to sleep so that stimulant portion is kind of like the ADHD portion where people can use it as a way just to give them a pop, a stimulus, a boost of energy, um, you know, like taking speed basically. So if we're doing that, then think about some of the symptoms that people experience with POTS. A lot of them can be relative to this secondary effect of having energy mobilization. So in other words, if I'm having a hard time feeding my brain, I'm not getting enough oxygen in there. I'm working really hard. My heart's beating like crazy. That's a secondary effect. The secondary effect is to try to produce more energy within the system. That's why you can, when you measure norepinephrine, it's going up because we're trying to drive that sympathetic signal more. We might see that volumes change. We may see that um, heart rate's going up, sweating's going up, um, the distal perfusion of the vessels is changing because we're trying to get more blood into the central system. Um, so all these things are, are secondary responses, changes in CO2 levels, but they're all to try to like preserve and compensate energy. So we're trying to pull blood into the middle and then be able to pump as much energy as we can to be able to deal with this problem we're having. A lot of people that ADHD will find that they do get oh, a jump in activity or clarity that comes with that because we're affecting um, we're, <laughs> we're affecting the cholinergic system, but on the back end of it, uh, it can also be harder to recover. And then we're also kind of giving that, that system some extra, uh, we're pressing it in a way that can make it harder to recover. So it is a common thing where people will use the stimulants. I generally tend not to get super excited about it because it usually means that after we solve after we solve the main problem, we're going to have to help them deal with solving the next one, which means you know, working with their prescribing doctor to help them tighter off of, of those medications as a way to kind of balance that back out and get the, the neurochemistry back on track again. So it's not my favorite thing. Um, if you're worried about it, I would talk to your prescribing doctor and just tell them what your concerns are and get them on your side. Um, don't be antagonistic. Don't go in like you know it all. Because they just turn off. And if they turn off, then they're not useful. And then you got to start all over again. But by being able to, to like find some common ground and saying, like, here's what I'm worried about. What do you think? It gives them the ability to then be able to like help you or like you help them come up with your solution, which can be really helpful. So I definitely am. I understand why that's hard. I also understand that like if you're already taking that medication coming off, it can seem like a bear. But it can also, in the short term, that energy is kind of like the only thing that you got. So it's hard to give it up. A lot of times we'll start trying to address the reflexive things first. We leave those medications alone. And then if we get to a point where people are feeling strong and they're like, okay, I'm, I'm doing really well. Now let's see if we can start to pull those medications off. Sometimes that can be, that is the approach we'll, we'll often use. Um, so you don't have to feel like a panic about trying to get off them necessarily right away unless you're you're having some other other problems. With sun exposure being beneficial, how much time in the sun would one need to reap the benefits if you're dark skinned? I read the dark, uh, darker folks absorb less. So actually you're going to, yeah. So it doesn't, it's not a perfect analogy, but you can kind of think of like the level of melanin in your skin or like the, the, the darkness of your skin is is dynamic and it changes relative to the amount of UV radiation that you're acquiring. So what's really cool, every cell's got a nucleus that has its DNA in it. And we know that radiation can affect the DNA, cause mutations which aren't good. But your body already knows this, which is pretty awesome. And what it will do is when the UV index starts to go up, we're getting more UV exposure. 
then we will see the skin respond by putting more melanin in the outer layer of the skin. And you can think about that as like, um, obviously the, the melan melanin's pigmented. So the darker the pigment, the more it's going to absorb. Just the same way, like when you look at your pupil, you want the light to be absorbed into that little black part there because that's where it's going to go be processed. But then you think about this white part on the outside, that's not really processing the light so much and that's white. So it's going to be a little bit more reflective. Um, so we will use that melanin as a way to be able to almost make ourselves little solar panels so we can absorb the sunlight, put it to work. But then also it allows us to be able, as it's absorbing it at it, it, this layer, uh, this layer, let's say, so the sun's coming in, it's absorbing it here, but it's also creating shade for that nuclear part of the cell on the inside that doesn't necessarily need that penetration of the sun, especially the UV radiation. Now, where it may account for more of that red light moving through the system, which is pretty cool how that works. So your question is, how much do you need? And then if, if you're darker skin. So generally speaking, if you've got darker skin, you, you actually need to have more input of the sun to be able to get to the same dose because it's being absorbed. Now, there are some simple rule of thumbs, but it's kind of the, the heuristics of that are like the darker your skin, the more the better. And you kind of build up a callus to it. There are people that talk about this uh, at large um, and kind of the more of a like a solar callus you're able to to develop, the more you can be in the sun and to be able to, to tolerate that. Now, the minimum dose would be thinking about it in three waves. You would think about like sunlight without UV and sunlight with UV. And we kind of want to maximize the sunlight without UV exposure early in the day because it primes the skin to be able to tolerate the UV in the middle of the day. We need a smaller dose of that. So most people can get away with, you know, 20-ish minutes as a minimum and the UV exposure during the summertime. And then once the, you know, the sun starts to go down, the UV exposure is down, then being able to maximize the kind of the more red light exposure on the back end of the day. Most of you have seen like red lights are wildly popular. We use them in the clinic, um, but they're, they're meant to mimic that time frame from our red sun where we're outside of the UV exposure and we're trying to stimulate that red light within the system. The sun's red light is better. It's it's denser, it's more full spectrum. It's kind of more what we're built to tolerate. And then adding in the dose of UV in the midday helps with circadian rhythms, but it also helps to give us that exposure um, of that the full spectrum of the sun. So I think it's a really good question, actually. I think we can talk a lot about more. There's some really good resources online, people that know a lot more about it than I do. But the way I usually recommend it is as much as you can while it's red light, work up to 20, 30 minutes or more, depending on your tolerance as you go during the, the peak daylight hours. And then once that sun starts to go down, kind of absorbing that red light again. The good news is when the UV is not there, you're not gonna get burned. Um, so you you can you can tolerate it more, even if you're of a very pale skin, which a lot of POTS folks are because they don't get to spend a lot of time outside. They don't do well in the heat. Uh, and that can be a good way to start to get some some gentle exposure as you're moving along. So. Great question. Thanks for asking that, Rob. Did I understand that correctly that red light from the sun is only for specific times of the day? Can you clarify what times? Okay, let me back that up. So the sun's always got predominance of red. When you look at a white light like these here, they've got a full spectrum of light, but it's not equal. It's not equally distributed through them all. The biggest portion of the spectrum is red, it's like 40%, a little bit more than 40%. And so in the morning times, you're getting a spectrum, but you'll notice like when the sun comes up, it's got that orangey hue to it because of the orientation of like how high the sun is in the sky. We're getting predominantly a red. We're getting all the colors, not any UV necessarily yet, but all the other colors. But that's predominant red. As it moves higher and higher, we start to see more of the UV exposure come in. It's still going to be red but it's going to be matched with a lot more blue and then the UV light. And then as it sinks down toward the end of the day, that UV light's going to wane and then it's going to, we're going to be left with the red light again. So, but if you're trying to get exposure to sunlight, the factor that's going to limit a lot of people is the actuality of getting burnt or the fear of getting burnt and the discomfort that comes with that. So the burning comes from UV exposure. So, what we can do to try to get a dose of sunlight or maximize the dose of sunlight without necessarily 
um, risking as much UV exposure is to try to do it in the off-peak hours when we're not getting the UV, which is going to be in the morning and at night, where we're getting predominantly red, we're not getting UV, and then we're able to take in as much of that light as we can without getting burned, which is nice. It's also a little cooler, a little easier to handle for some of our pot spokes. But then trying to get in the middle of the day, being able to get a little dose so that we can get some of that UV exposure, stimulate the skin, stimulate the melanin so that we can drive those processes as well, which have a lot to do with detoxification. Um, when you think about absorbability, things that have high melanin concentrations are very good at holding on to heavy things like metals, like molds. So that allows us to be able to help in those detoxes. A lot of people don't talk about that, but... Um, if you're someone that's trying to, to do a little detox regimen, sunlight becomes a very important part of that because of not only melanin in your skin, but also neuromelanin, neuropsin. Neuropsin is also kind of like what makes our motor system work. Our dopamine system is built on this neuropsin and the substantia nigra of the midbrain. So it's beautiful. So sunlight has like a way bigger role than we usually think to give it. But if you can, it's kind of like as much sunlight as you can get tolerably is probably a good idea for most people. And it might take a couple seasons for a lot of people to start even getting tolerant of the sun. I see a lot of people that like in that first year, they, they can go in the sun and they get zero change in skin color. They get zero tan. It, you wouldn't know that they were even in the sun. They're more likely to get burned. So you got to be more gentle with the exposure on the UV side, just a couple minutes at a time. But then... In the next season, in the next season, you'll see that starts to change and they can darken their skin and they're able to tolerate sunlight. It's really interesting. Um, definitely, if you're interested in that, there, there are a lot of cool resources, but there's a whole lot about sunlight that's that's super useful for, for humankind, especially in terms of energy production.